Thanks, thanks, David. Um, I'd just like to thank David for inviting me to come and talk with this band of very talented and prolific circadian biologists, uh, physiologists. I'm just a physiologist who got lucky a few times. So, right. So, um, I became interested in circadian rhythms basically because I stumbled on Martin Martin Young's work because I was interested in reperfusion injury, and he, and of course, reperfusion injury has. Uh, a lot to, to do with metabolism. So what I'm going to talk about vascular. So what, what's, what do we know about the circadian profile of blood pressure? Well, while a lot has been known um, from quite a long way back, and principally when we move from a resting period, um, this is so to a resting period from, from a, 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 an active period, there's a decrease in sympathetic drive and an increase in vagal tone. And if we look at this um, picture from 1987, what you'll notice is that um, cardiac output dropped quite significantly here, and this, this is reflected by a reduction in heart rate and stroke volume. And what we see so is this results in a drop in mean arterial blood pressure which is what you would expect. But what is unexpected is an increase in total peripheral resistance. So remember, this is um, going to a, during the day when the animal's at rest. The same sort of profile is seen in um, adult healthy males, humans, and you can see here Heart rate falls, stroke volume declines a little bit, but not too much, and there's a, a drop in cardiac output. And this is reflected by a reduction in mean arterial blood pressure and an increase in to uh, total peripheral resistance. Now, this isn't simply driven by inactivity or an increase in activity, as this sort of profile is also seen in adult males who are um, in, in bed rest. Okay, so what we decided to do was to look at what's happening in the individual um, uh, resistance vessels isolated from mesentery vessels of uh, the rat. This is a simple picture of a myograph with the, the vessel inside. And then we can apply agonists and look at contractile function. So what we did, and this, is, this has been shown before in aortic vessels, so we wanted to look more at mesenteric, mesenteric uh, resistance vessels as they are probably more reflective of what's contributing to total peripheral resistance. And you can see that if you um, challenge these vessels with phenylephrine, which is an alpha-1 agonist to cause contraction, you can see that if you isolate these cells during the rest, this tissue during the resting period, they respond quite um, strongly to phenylephrine, but if you do so in the active period, these cells don't respond or don't contract as strongly. And um, so if we look... Similarly, if we activate or activate contraction with a high potassium of about 60 millimolar, you can also see there is a reduction in the strength of contraction in the active phase, which suggests that this time of day variation is not driven by a simple receptor binding. Okay, so um, prior to this, we, we had looked in um, contractile function in adult rat ventricular myocytes, and we showed that um, in response to isoproterenol, we had a much greater response during the resting period than in the active period. And you can see that here. These are calcium transients during the resting period and the active period in response to isoproterenol. However, when we put on um, LNNA, which is a nonspecific uh, nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, we found that we were able to boost the response, both in the resting period, but much more so in the active period. 
Okay, so if you look at the percentage increase, there was much more of an increase in the active period. And we suggest this is due to um, nitric oxide signaling. So as you all know, nitric oxide signaling is paramount in vascular uh, contractility. So we then proceeded to look at what happens um, in the vascular smooth muscle. And here you can see, simply we've shown the presence of some of these um, clock genes, BMAL and clock, and the output per two. Then we looked at what was happening to um, ENOS um, trans transcription, and we saw this also showed a very nice 24-hour cycling. There's also, we'll ignore this for now, but we also were able to show that if we looked at our two time points of act active um, period here and resting, there was a significant increase in protein content as well. <clears throat> Right, so um, everybody knows that we all know that the endothelial cell signals via its diastylcholine to an increase in ENOS. So clearly, if we think ENOS is um, important here, we should have a difference in acetylcholine-induced relaxation, which we do find. So this is pre-constricted with phenylephrine, and we challenge with acetylcholine and we see that there is a time of day variation in response. We get much more um, of a response during the active period when ENOS is high. So here's our endothelial cell. We then decided, well, what happens if we inhibit with L-name for the phenylephrine-induced contraction? And you can see here... Here's the cell, the, the two types of resting and active period vessels contracting in phenylephrine. And if we put L name on, we can boost that contraction. And you see that this difference between the resting and active period is all but abolished in the presence of nitric oxide synthase inhibition. We then wanted to know, well, clearly. Is it only nitric, is it the nitric oxide in the endothelial cell? So we denuded these cells using a, um, a human hair, not mine, because I'm quite old and my hair's quite coarse. So we, we had younger hair. And uh, if you take out the endothelial cells by, by taking, by you, uh, pushing this human hair through the lumen of the, the uh, vessel, and then challenge with phenylephrine, you can see that our difference has now gone between the resting and active period. We also found that if you look at the potassium response, you can also see um, that this difference which we see in our normal vessels has gone when we denude the vessels. So, is nitric oxide important for circadian variations? Well, it's been shown probably not to be, and we don't think it is either. However, what's interesting, if you see here, this is, our, um, this is a global ENOS knockout, and this is the wild type, and you can still see, see a circadian pattern. It's taken from um, a 2007 paper. However, if you look at the time of day variation or change in systolic blood pressure, you can see here in the wild type animal and here in the ENOS. So there's quite a big difference. So you knock out ENOS, you get a much bigger variation. This um, is also been shown in a, a further paper in uh, but this one I just wanted to show you because it's actually highlighting actual measurements of systolic arterial blood pressure. And you can see here in an ENOS knockout, what you would expect is hypertension. This is also seen during the dark period when the animal is active. And you can see the circadian variation is still there between light and dark. And it's also still there between light and dark in the ENOS knockout, but importantly, you can see the difference between the dark and light is significantly higher, both in terms of systolic 
arterial pressure and diastolic pressure in the knockout mass. What is driving the circadian variation in blood pressure may be more to do with this paper here um, in 2015 by Z and his colleagues. And here they were looking at a BMAL knockout, and it was a, a smooth muscle for specific knockout. And um, oops, sorry, what we have here is phenylephrine binds to alpha-1 adrenal receptors, stimulating the rokinase uh, pathway to bring about an inhibition of myosin light chain phosphatase, and you get contraction. What this group was able to show is that BMAL actually causes, binds to the uh, transcription of rho kinase 2, increasing its activity, but also regulating its ability to phosphorylate this protein here. In the absence of the knockout, what they were able to show was that you get an increase in this protein here, uh, phosphorylation, resulting in um, contraction. And there's a time of day variation, so that during the active period, this activity here, or the activity of this uh, protein here is decreased. In the knockout, this was completely gone. So there was no time of day variation, either in the levels of rho kinase 2, the, its activity, and therefore contraction. If you look at the intact animal, you can see that the circadian rhythm, although it's still there, is significantly blunted here in the wild type, and this is in the knockout for systolic and diastolic pressure. But remember, this animal is still subject to sympathetic regulation, which is changing over the 24-hour period. So in summary, um, there is a move to sympathetic dominance and moving from the resting to active state, and... Um, this is going to impact on cardiac output through stroke volume and heart rate, but also in total peripheral resistance. The increase in ENOS signaling, we would suggest, reduces vasoconstriction in response to alpha-1 stimulation, and this decreases the rise in t total peripheral resistance during the move to the active phase. And why is this important? Well, we think... This is combining with the increase in NNOS signaling that we've shown in the heart, which we show to depress contractile uh, function during heavy sympathetic stimulation. And this combines to reduce cardiac output and limit the increase in blood pressure in response to sympathetic stimulation. And this is possibly likely to have a protective effect during a uh, movement to um, an active period when sympathetic-driven cardiovascular events are known to occur, such as stroke, arrhythmia, and, met and MI. I think what's really important is during disease, not only do you, can you get a depression of these signals or these circadian variations, but they can actually change in phase by several hours. So you might get a misbalance in what's happening in the heart and the vasculature, to what is being driven by sympathetic activity. Just like to a fairly small group of us, the Matthew, Matthew Deniff worked on the wire migraphy and RT-PCR, and all of the adult rep ventricular myocyte work was done by Dr. Collins, who's here in the audience. Thank you.